Hi everyone, and welcome to WiseLine. We are very happy to have you here today. Hello to all WiseLiners and to the people new to our networks. My name is Laura Perales, Academy Program Coordinator at WiseLine. For those who haven't heard about WiseLine or WiseLine Academy before, let me do a very quick introduction, okay? WiseLine is a software development and design services company with operations in the United States, Mexico, Vietnam, Thailand, Australia, and Spain, with six years of experience and 800 employees worldwide. We started as a product company and gradually migrated to the services once we realized that we could help other high growth companies to build better products faster through our different disciplines, such as technical writing, user experience, project management, SRE, QA, etc. WiseLine is the trusted ally of brands such as National Geographic, Shape Security, and the Washington Post. And as part of our culture, WiseLine empowers employees and the community to innovate and grow their careers. This is the reason why WiseLine Academy was created. Widen Academy is a platform that offers free educational programs such as workshops, talks, and certifications in today's most high value skills in technology, like today's talk prepared by Clara and Emilio, two of our experts in UX. Um, you can follow us on social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn to learn about upcoming courses. And last but not least, Enjoy the course, try to be focused, ask as much as you want about the topic and do some networking, okay? This space was uh, created for you. So thanks again uh, to everyone and Clara, Emilio, thanks in advance for your dedication and for sharing your knowledge. The mic is all yours. Thank you very much, Lau. Welcome everyone to this webinar. Let me first introduce you to Emilio. Hi everybody, um, we're super happy and excited to be here today. Um, as Clara said, my name is Emilio Uribe. I'm a big visual designer at WiseLine, where I love um, creating frameworks and tools and processes for our peers to uh, develop their, their work better. I love working with clients doing consultancy regarding branding, visual design, and, and all matters regarding user interface. And, I'm super proud and happy to introduce you to Clara. Thank you, Emilio. I'm Clara Valderas. I'm a lead UX designer at WiseLine. And part of what I do in my day-to-day -day activities is um, to listen to people, to observe them as they are using technology, and then try to figure out ways to do technology more friendly and more easy to use. And of course, something that I uh, really enjoy is uh, facilitating workshops with stakeholders and building the strategy along with the team and finally uh, finding a way to um, make things uh, happen that are feasible that are uh, business uh, goals oriented and of course that are user centered so uh, welcome everybody in this session i'm going to give a little bit of uh rules or lay of the land. Um, please turn off your microphones to avoid having noise. Um, if it happens to unmute or something, don't worry about it. Uh, it can happen to anyone. I know it has happened to me. Um, but if it's consistent, we might uh, need to mute you. So don't take that um, personally. It's just so the session runs better for everybody else. Um, you can raise your hand if you like to say something. But we are creating a spot for questions until the end of the presentation. Since we have a lot of content today planned for you, um, we would rather have uh, all questions at the end. So please take note of them and we'll make sure to address them. Um, you can use the Zoom chat for underground communication and to interact with, with other people. This is highly encouraged. We have it here so we can take a, a quick glance if anything comes up. Maybe if we have uh, audio problems, you can let us know. and. Um, We'll be happy to read you. And finally, uh, this session is going to be recorded uh, for documentation and spreading purposes. So um, be sure to smile if you have your camera on. And uh, sorry about that. Um, Clara is going to give us an introduction about this course right now. Thank you. So uh, we wanted to begin with this um, kind of question, which is UX designer or UX specialist. 
So um, what are the difference, or what's the difference between the two of them? Um, am I supposed to choose a specialty right from the beginning or should I wait to some point of my career to make a decision on that? As you know, uh, in most industries, we're aiming to have these uh, T-shaped professionals. In this visual metaphor, the depth of knowledge comes from top to bottom. So this yellow part here uh, would be related to this knowledge that is broad. Um, this, this is where generalists would lay. Um, because in, in this part, we're talking about no, um, knowing the fundamentals or what is enough to know of each of the areas. And then at some point of your career, you might go um, in verticality, you might go deep into one particular area. So here the question is, um, is that really necessary? Should we need to become a specialist at some point or may I just say as a UX generalist? Um, for the purpose, we added this quote, which you really like, it's from Jayma Nichols. It says, being a generalist is great, However, it's not the generalists that push the industry forward. And this is because at the end, specialists are the ones who are going to produce more knowledge and the ones who are going to contribute to the industry. It's the content that they produce that generalists will consume. And then, well, at some point, um, some years later, um, you might be able to go into the m shape um, designer, which means that you are able to not only uh, apply your knowledge across different situations, but also across domains. That being said, this is the road that we're going to be uh, following today. So we're going to please introduce you to the UX specialties uh, very quickly. And then we're going to go into personality traits, natural talents. Uh, we are going to be using those elements to choose a specialty. And Finally, we have this uh, testimonials section of the session, which is for us is, is uh, one of the most important ones because here we, we have brought some designers from our team and we are really proud of them and the way they have built their careers. And so uh, we hope we get there um, in the best way possible. And finally, we're, we're going to have these questions and answers section. Awesome. So I'm going to begin um, talking about um, not, not only UX specialties, but how did we come up with this idea? And I'd love to start with a question for the audience, which is, um, if you had to choose today, which UX specialty would you choose? Um, and we decided to make this grouping. Um, there could be discussion uh, regarding UX strategies and product designer being grouped, for example, or um, UI designer being included in the role of visual designer. but um, from our own personal experience, this is the grouping that we chose. And we wanted to tell you that uh, when we wanted to create this webinar, the idea that we had is uh, how can we give uh, all of you all the resources to make a, a better decision that's not only based on information. Uh, so that's when we came up with, why don't we approach it through a way that we can tell you where you could be good at um, just by being who you are. And, and, and that's what we think is the value in this presentation. And Clara is going to talk about the, the three pillars that we chose um, for this webinar. Sure. So um, whenever a, a person would come with this question, uh, the way we would um, be able to answer that is by making more questions. So the first one is, how does your mind work? What are those patterns of feelings, thoughts, and behaviors that you already have? Then what are you naturally good at? What are the things that you are already doing better than most people? And finally, what is your background? And in this point, we need to be very specific um, about what we, what we mean with this, because it's not about uh, having a UX background. You know, there are very few education programs that include UX as, as a core. So uh, it is very common to have UX designers who have uh, come from different disciplines and the idea behind this is that uh, depending on the discipline you come from or be, depending on the area you have uh, been working for years, that area will, will give you some knowledge and experience that you can use in your advantage when choosing a UX specialty. So for example, let's think of a, of a person who has dedicated part of his life to um, exact sciences. And so they might be analytical at some point. And here, 
and they might be uh, doing a really good job in things such as quantitative user research. Um, let's think also of developers or software engineers who have this knowledge about feasibility um, and they might have this um, broad point of view when, when we are talking about product design and they might be able to be aware of the effort that is needed to implement the features that are being designed. Also something really important to add, I believe, is that even when we did a lot of research to help you make um, the best decisions on how to give you an edge over your competition and other peers on how to choose one of these specialties, in the end, nothing beats your, in, your personal interesting, interests and passion. So uh, no matter the results of what we're going to show you, in the end, if you want to choose one of the specialties and you don't see your, your profile fit for that, that doesn't mean that you cannot be good at that. It's, it's only that we're taking an approach to help you, um, let's say, jumpstart this decision process in case that you're a little bit lost or, or feeling uncertain about that. And um, it's now time to move into personality traits, which uh, Clara is going to explain us a little bit deeper. For sure. So. Um, what is personality? I'm pretty sure that most of us have um, heard of it more than once and some of us might have already done a test that will tell us what is our personality type. Um, but basically what personality is, is uh, what makes us different to other people, right? In the way that we behave, in the, in the way that we feel and we relate to others. Um, so let's think of personality as that uh, that makes us unique. And at the end, personality traits will reflect our characteristic patterns of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. How many personalities are there? Uh, if we go back to the first definition about uh, personalities, we, that is something that makes us different to others, we might say that there are as much personalities as people in the world. Um, however, packaging personalities or grouping them makes it easier to research around, and makes it easier to understand so um, today we're going to cover two approaches. Uh, well, the first one is this Myers-Briggs type indicator, which was um, initiated with, by Carl Jung, the father of the analytic psychology. And his work was noticed after that uh, by Catherine Cook and Isabel Briggs Myers, who are mother and daughter. And the two of them are the authors of this a very common approach uh, whenever you take a test, a personality test, that is based on this approach, you will get something like this. So this is a four-letter acronym, and what it will tell you is that you are falling into one of these variables, introversion or extraversion, sensing or intuition, thinking or feeling, and judging or perceiving. Uh, so depending on the one you are falling, uh, your personality type is built. If we were to think of a radically different personality to this one, we would have this, uh, which is uh, basically the opposite um, variables that are being um, selected here. So after that, we have the second approach, which is the big five personality traits. It's also called the ocean. And some people might say that it would, would start with Hippocrates, and then we have several people who contributed to this approach across um, many, many years. And it started with a list of 16,000 words to describe people, but at the end, they came out with only five. And would be openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neurotism. The main difference between this approach and the other one is that um, rather than using types, here we're talking about traits. And this means that we don't have uh, a way to fall on one or the other, it's not binary is more like a spectrum. So you have openness and you, are, uh, you have this at a certain degree. And conscientiousness also, you might have certain degree of it. Um, that makes it um, much more uh, accurate in some way. And finally, we have this Neurosomalytics Limited. This is a third approach and is the one that we're going to be using today and the one that we use for our research within the team. Um, this is combining the two approaches into one. So we have, on one side, we have these uh, types or that are now transformed into traits, extrovert versus introvert, intuitive versus observant, thinking versus feeling, judging versus prospecting, and finally, they added one fifth one, which is assertive versus turbulent. We are going to explain a little bit um, of each of them, so 
Um, you can have an idea in case you haven't done a test yet, you will have an idea of what your personality might be. So um, the first one is extrovert versus introvert. And we might think of extrovert people as those who might be described as talkative and outgoing. They gain energy from their interaction with others and they may, um, they could be also um, very, very um, into social uh, interaction. They like fast paced environments and so on. Introverts on the other side might be uh, considered as shy or timid. Uh, they might uh, feel um, overwhelmed after having a lot of interaction with other people and they might need their own time. Uh, we have also intuitive versus observant um, people in the second spectrum. We think about observant people as people that what they see is what it is. So they tend to take a lot of decisions based on facts and what is already on the table. Um, on the other hand, intuitive people uh, really look at the world as what could be. They also love uh, thinking about possibilities and they, they see potential in, in everything. Then we have thinking versus feeling. We might think of thinking type people, the ones who are more rational, the ones that will look uh, for the, um, the logic on, and this um, left brain sided people who, who, are, um, who value justice, for example. And on the other side, we have feeling people who are more aware of how they are making feel others around them. So they might be more empathetic. We also have judging and prospecting people. Judging people tend to be um, those who really like things done a certain way. They love limits and rules uh, to play with and, and to explore those constraints. While prospecting people tend to see uh, they love surprises, they love discovery, they love uh, learning as they go. So you can see um, how it contrasts with judging as well. Then we have assertive and turbulent. Uh, assertive people tend to be more calm and relaxed. They feel well about the circumstances that are around them at this moment. And they are uh, more um, go with the flu. They have a more, a, a more go with the flu attitude. On the other side, the turbulent people are more, um, are more aware of what they are doing and how they could do that better. So they might be considered as perfectionists. So after we have all these traits, we come uh, to these 16 personalities. Um, uh, here we have these groupings, which are sentinels, analysts, diplomats, and explorers. And something very interesting to, um, to sit at this point is that uh, at the end, personality will use two approaches. The first one is focused on the particularities of each um, personality. So for example, the introvert versus extrovert uh, part, but it's also considering that each of these personalities at the end will become something bigger than the sum of its components. So at the end, having one specific combination will uh, detonate a series of things that will include the way we behave and the way uh, that we at the end uh, think and feel and of course um, what are we what are we going to be more um, good at or what are the things that we are going to be um, doing naturally so um, with that being said um, this is a website 16personalities.com where you can find more information about this and you can have uh, you can you can take a free test in there and you, you will have uh, plenty of more information regarding the, the background and, and also some theory. We uh, included this frequent asked questions related to personality. So the first one is, are the results of a test reliable? And the answer would be that uh, there is no one single test that is 100% reliable. However, there are several ways to make uh, your results more reliable. For example, it is highly recommended to not take the test when you are in a particular mood. So you might not want to take the test if you are feeling angry or hungry. Um, you might not want to take the test when you are in a hurry, for example, or in a rush. Um, it's important that you, are, um, you feel stability while you are taking it. 
The second question is, will results change over time? Uh, yes, this might happen if our surroundings or our context changes abruptly. So let's think if that if you are moving to another city or you have just uh, switched your job, uh, in those cases, you might want to wait until from three to six months until things feel stable again, and then you can re retake the test. It is also highly recommended to take more than one test just to improve the chance that you will get the best results. And finally, where can I take the test? So we included some links. The first two are using this approach that we talked about. 16 personalities is the one that we recommend. Then there is human metrics, which is accurate. Um, it's not very visual though. And the last two are um, using this ocean approach um, of the five big personality traits. The first one is for free, and the second one is not free, but it's, it's really worth it. Um, it. It gives you clue not only on the degree of, 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 the, of the traits that you have, but also what it means or what are the implications in your, in your daily life. Amazing. So now it's time to move into natural talents. And uh, I'd love to open this topic by asking another question, which is, what are you better at than another 10,000 people? Um, now this question uh, for some of you might be super easy to answer. Maybe you play competitive sports or um, you are very competitive in video games and you have access to a ranked system or a leaderboard that allows you to say, of course, I'm better than 10,000 people at this. Um, um, but when we think about it as what, what part of you as a person makes you better than other 10,000 people or the way your brain is wired, how does that make you better than, than those people? The question starts to become a little bit more complex. So uh, when we're talking about these um, traits or strengths, it's important to, to remind ourselves to the way that, um, that our brain is configured. When we're born, we're born with somewhere around 10,000 million of neurons, which is a lot. I don't even think I've ever seen a number of that in, in any case. And these neurons, during the first three years of your development, they're going to start creating a richer connection with sp other specific neurons, thus creating, for example, avenues that we're going to call the strong, uh, deep connections. And we're going to have streets, which are weaker connections that you may have. And we have this very lovely visual example. Um, when you reach the age of 15, these specific connections and configurations already make your brain a certain unique way um, that makes you potentially better not only than 10,000 people, but than 33 million people by the way this is configured. So when you were 15 with your skateboard and with that beanie, you already had the potential to be much, much better um, than other people to a specific, um, some specific things. And all of this is crafted um, by your experiences uh, during your early developmental years. So it's a part of who you are. It's the way your brain is wired and that's why this is so important to us and we wanted to include it in this webinar. Um, when we think about the impact, um, these natural predispositions, call it strengths, call them traits, they really determine how we connect with other people how we achieve our goals, how we even think about those goals, what motivates us, what, what is the things that we want, uh, how we move ourselves and others towards actions, um, how we reflect upon ourselves and others, how we think about um, success, for example, and um, how we learn. So uh, as you can see, these are very, very, very quintessential uh, aspects of who you are and using them to your advantage is the best thing you can do on a professional um, environment and really uh, throughout your life. Um, if you wanted to identify these uh, particular traits without taking a test, you might, you might have found during your, your life that some people tell you, you are really good at this, but not only that, it seems like you do it effortlessly. And even if you put a lot of work into that, um, to the point you reach mastery, the idea is that uh, these things, when you are under pressure, for example, they're the first resources that you're going to go at. And they're, they're your almost a reptilian way of thinking. Um, that's just how you're wired and what you're good at. And it's also important to uh, understand that we, they could be called strengths because we're going to use them as them. 
but they can also be considered as a flow because they're traits really. So for example, let's think of uh, one of the traits is analytical. When we have someone who's very analytical, that's a way to contribute, right? So they're gonna make sure that they um, really take a look at every nook and cranny so they can understand um, potential risk, identify flaws and, and figure out um, how to make that uh, project or uh, that feature perfect. If you're not used to working with someone who's that analytical, you might find yourself thinking, oh my God, this person is never satisfied. He never finds um, things, um, they, they never like anything or they're always finding uh, uh, the needle in the haystack when it comes to errors. So it's very important to you um, when you understand these traits that you know that that's their way to contribute. And if you really understand that that's how their brain is wired, you then start thinking about these traits as opportunities as well. So then you don't, you don't feel like, you don't take it personal and you understand, yeah, for sure, he's very analytical and that's his job and that's what he's gonna do. And we can, of course, of course talk about it, but understanding it, it, it's a very crucial part of this. And uh, Clara's gonna explain us a little bit more about this uh, specific research and how it came to be. For sure, so um, the framework that we are uh, basing this on is uh, the Clifton Strengths framework. And it, is, it was um, generated by the Gallup company. What they did is that um, they made a research with more than two million people, uh, but these people had something in common, and that is that they were excellent at their jobs. So they might include um, excellent uh, doctors, excellent teachers, um, excellent firemen, and they, um, they interviewed them to understand where this, this excellence uh, was, was based on. And what they found is that um, there were more than 400 uh, teams of talent uh, behind these people. And at the end, they were able to group them into only 34, which would be the most prevalent teams of talent. These are the ones. So we can have uh, here some, some pillars. The first one is relationship building, which includes talents such as adaptability, harmony, connectedness, includer, um, strategic thinking, analytical context, intellection, futuristic, and so on. Influencing, activator, common, communication, maximizer, um, and others. And there is executing, which is, um, which is including talents such as achiever, arranger, belief, etc. So the thing here is that um, some of this might be uh, always seen as a good thing. Let's think of, uh, for example, uh, responsibility, right? We have, um, if we hear that one person has a talent, we will for sure uh, feel good about that person. We will think of, of, of that, of her as a reliable person. Um, however, as Emilio said, it has, um, it, it, it has two faces and it's important to get to know those faces. Yeah, and another thing that is important is um, that this study, the, the real result bases on your top five um, themes of talent. And just as the personality, the sum of these top five is greater, it, it, the, this top five are, is greater than the sum of its parts. So um, it's important that you understand how they relate to each other and to yourself to make it so unique. And you may see that there could be some overlap uh, between, for example, relationship building or influencing or strategic thinking and executing. Uh, it's not the grouping that really counts. This is just so it's better to study them. But the idea is for you to really, really dive into each one of these. And when you really start um, reading about them, um, thinking about how how did those become to be? Uh, what experiences in your life made you have this? And how have you been using them? And how you can um, exploit them to your advantage and to use them uh, in all aspects of your life? That's when you're gonna really find the value of this approach. Um, and, and that's why it makes it so, so powerful. Um, again, we prepare some frequently asked questions. Um, are personalities and talents related? Of course they are. Um, they're, they're deeply intricate and when you take both tests or you dig deeper into, into both, you're not gonna feel surprised. You're not gonna have uh, opposite results. 
in all of our research, we, we found a lot of consistency. And something that I think it's important that I mentioned is that when you get your top five, you might, it happen in your research, you might find some others that are really important to you personally that are not part of your top five or your top 10. And you might think, oh, wow, I'm, I'm a little bit bummed that um, I, I really, for example, love um, the relationship building aspect of, of, of these skills. And I cannot believe I'm not good at, at those. But that's not the idea. The idea is that you can use your top five or your top 10 to really develop the others and to really understand how to learn the others and how to approach them. So this does, this never works in a restrictive way, but it gives you, it tells you really what you're good at naturally. So you can use that optic to change whatever you wanna do with, with the rest of them. Um, where results change over time, this one's a little bit tricky because this, the, the background of this is that it sets on your early developmental years, like, a, uh, like we told you at age three and 15 especially. But if you are, um, if, if you are going um, through really life-changing events, uh, drastic stress or something that it's shaping and, and, and it's completely deconstructing who you are, something could be like an ego death or something, you might see change it, but changes uh, and slight variations. But the idea is that this one is more based in who you already are. So you're not going to... Um, see that change over time. Of course, that it, uh, as the last recommendations, don't, don't take this test with a specific set of mood or when you're going through um, a transitional phase in your life. And where you can do the test, here you have uh, two links. We use the, the first one, which is a paid uh, test. It's, it's pricing goes around 50 to $60 regarding, uh, sometimes they have promotions or sometimes the, the prices vary and of course, dollar versus peso. But um, we really recommend it because they give you a really in-depth report at the end uh, that is very, very useful and could be the fuel uh, for your career growth in the future. Um, we're not <laughs> endorsed or supported by, by Gallup uh, by any means, but we want to tell you that by the research we've done and we've taken personally, the, rest, the results are uncanny. So, so we really believe in, in, in this instrument. And if you don't have that budget, this perfect moment, you can also take the second one, which is uh, free, and can give you a, a similar, but not that in-depth um, look at, at your personal talent. So now it's time that we go into the, the, the meat of this uh, webinar, and we appreciate your patience because we really needed to fill you in, in all of these contexts so you can understand what we did and the guides that we created for you uh, to understand what you could be better at when choosing a specialty. And what we created are these, um, we, let, we call it cheat sheets, we're gonna go through them, where we have the description of the, of the specialty, if you're not familiar with that, uh, a couple of main activities uh, of that uh, same, same, um, same discipline. Uh, some of the personalities that are based on our research, uh, we think could really uh, develop themselves better in this particular, um, specialty and of course the strengths related and that can give you an edge over your competition in this. So I'm gonna, ah, and finally we have um, some of the backgrounds that we typically seen and that we, we think and we've seen that we, they can give you an edge because of the, of the subject matters they, they, they touch. And finally a couple of quotes to inspire you and to help you understand why your team, for example, is um, leaning towards those specialties. So I'm gonna start with interaction designer. Um, those are the people that define the way that users will dialogue with a digital product or strategy. They draw a lot upon user data, research, uh, team input. They generate interaction concepts and they enable seamless and relevant experience for users. Uh, if I were to be an interaction designer, the thing that I would be doing daily would be thinking about UX writing, visual presentations and behaviors. Uh, and I would use this thinking to develop strategies to improve the interaction between users and products. I will create prototypes, either rapid ones or robust ones to validate design concepts, whether it's with stakeholders and, and users as well. And I will really need to communicate design principles and direction in very high detail. Uh, also design specification, for example, to engineers, development teams, and any technical uh, part that's related in this. But something I would like to add about an interaction designer is that the prototypes that they are going to build 
uh, might not be high fidelity, but low fidelity ones, which means that uh, their prototypes might be black and white um, only to understand how users are going to interact with the solution. They might think of user flows, for example, how will they go from one screen to the other? And they will not be focused on the details or the visual aspects of the design. Awesome. Um, when we're thinking about personality, we can see um, a, a little pattern between in, intuitive um, traits. Uh, they're known from their rationality and impartiality, but we also see some uh, exploratory themes, which are um, they, they're known for their ingenuity and their flexibility. And when we look at the strengths, uh, achiever is someone who needs daily um, daily tasks to complete to feel productive and to feel successful. So that's going to be super handy because they're usually um, running against backlogs, heavy backlogs, and, and doing uh, balancing all of these tasks and prioritizing, so that's gonna be good. Someone who's good at consistency is gonna be great to create scalable interaction um, patterns or, or even system. Someone who's really adaptable so they can change what they're seeing after they do some concept testing or some validation with users. Um, Includer is a trait that that means that you're always trying to make sure that nobody is left out. So that's going to be fantastic for this kind of uh, specialty because we want to make sure that you go into topics such as accessibility, uh, ergonomics, for example, and you want to make sure that everybody's able to use your product. And finally, uh, ideation is very self-explanatory. Somebody that uh, is very capable to bring new ideas to the table to solve problems. Um, Backgrounds that we've seen that are useful, information technologies, arts and design, marketing and communication. And I'd like to share one of the quotes, which is from Marco, one of our uh, teammates, which is, uh, he chose interaction design because he, he finds passion on driving the human research into efficient processes at scale. So you can uh, start piecing these together and, and, and it's pretty interesting. Um, I'm, I'm gonna also explain you a little bit about uh, visual designer. We usually aim to improve a design's uh, or product aesthetic appeal and usability uh, through all of the design principles and, and, and suitable artifacts. Um, if I were to be a visual designer, which I am, uh, <laughs> the main activities that I do every day, I establish the looking fields for interfaces, websites, mobile devices, pretty much every touch point that involves a, a, a visual interface. Um, for users and consumers. Uh, I will develop or work within brand guidelines. This is to create uh, materials that really communicate the brand values and attributes um, through the visual po touch points of, of, of the projects or products that I'm working with. Finally, um, it's a lot of collaborating with development and business um, to, solve it, to solve complex issues, something like interaction models and a lot of data visualizations so everything is clear and show to the right eyes and right time. and um, yeah, when we think about the personalities, we're leaning more toward explorers in this case, uh, um, flexible, spontaneous, and ingenious. And we also have diplomats, which are very empathic and, and passionate and sometimes idealistic. So those are the type of personalities that could perform better in visual design based, based on our research. Um, when we talk about the strengths, we go back again to achiever consistency to make sure that we do create a scalable design system, for example. Discipline, so you're able to uh, these same design systems to make sure that they're they're consistent and you have the reins over the, over the projects and you keep everything under control. Um, a lot of communication, competition in this case comes interestingly because, um, for example, brand management is the, the management of difference. So for you to really understand what makes product A different than product B, uh, and use that as a selling point. For, uh, for your products, that's where you're gonna capitalize a lot on this discipline. Included, of course, making sure that nobody is left uh, outside. Um, we need people that are very empathic for, for this. Um, so you can really try to understand how are people feeling when they're taking a look at, at your interfaces. Are you conveying the attributes that you wanted to? And finally, uh, such as uh, Interaction Center, people that are able to put new ideas on the table to innovate are always welcome in this discipline. Backgrounds, we've seen a little bit more narrow in this one, which is much more uh, towards design and marketing and their communications. But remember, you don't have to have this to become a visual designer. You can come from any, any background. The, the, the real thing to look at is 
uh, if this is your interest and if you're passionate about this. And what, uh, one of the quotes that I really liked is that um, uh, Carla said that she chose visual design because she loved finding solutions that are not only visually appealing, but really transmit concepts. And I think that's one of the things that I love about my work as well. Okay, so now I will uh, walk through to, you, to the, the specialty of user research. A user researcher is a person who will be uh, observing users in order to understand their needs and their behaviors. Um, and they will also using these um, methodologies that are, might be qualitative or quantitative um, in order to get valuable insights to inform the design process. One of the main activities of a user research are creating strategies because uh, we need to understand uh, first what is the things that we want to learn about the users and then we are going to choose one method or the other accordingly so we will get the data that we need. And there is observing and listening to users regarding the use of a product or service. That would be for qualitative research where we are in the, in the need of, of understanding deeply what are the needs that are uh, and the needs and the goals of the users that are behind their behaviors. When we are uh, doing quantitative research, we will be observing patterns, measuring metrics related to users' behaviors that will help us understand the impact of, of one usability problem, for example. And then they will analyze and synthesize the data because after we execute, we will get too much information that we need to transform into insights that are actionable for the team and that is working on the product or for the stakeholders who are defining the strategy. The personalities that we found um, the most likable to be uh, for a user researcher are uh, first of all architect and logician. The architects are people who are very strategic so they are known as the masterminds and in user research it's very important to keep that in mind. We are not only executing one method uh, for the purpose of that, but that will be it's, um, that will be crucial in our process to get information we need to to make decisions, make design decisions. Then there is the logician. Logicians tend to be very curious and very um, thirsty of knowledge. So. Um, it is very important because user research is about learning, learning every day, learning about users, learning about um, what they are doing, why are they doing that, etc. Then mediators and protagonists, uh, they, are, um, they are really good at dealing with people because they tend to be empathetic, which is very important for qualitative user research. Logisticians on the other side, um, they are very practical and entertainers are very good at communicating. So let's think of a user researcher as the mediator uh, between the users and the business or the users and the designers or the developers. So that's a way it's very important to have those communication skills. And in Clifton Strength, we will see that. We will see also command. Command because as a user researcher, you will be uh, leading a team towards the research objectives. And then we have of course, the relationship building strengths, adaptability, connectedness, empathy, and individualization. Individualization is, is one particular I really like uh, because it's about finding the particularities in, in what you're seeing, for example, a person, and you will see that person as unique, and that will help you uh, really understand, uh, understand the pieces without feeling that you have already seen that and make you blind to those things. And of course, we have um, several strengths that are related to the strategic pillar, analytical context, input, learner, and strategic. Can I ask you a question? For sure. Uh, what does it seem like a lot of people could be researcher? Like, this is the first one where we see a lot of personalities, a lot of strengths. Yeah, uh, that's very interesting because, um, well, my, my first answer would be that user research might be seen as one discipline, but it covers uh, a broad range of, um, of activities that, and you need different skills for each of those activities. So as it said at first, it is important for a user research to think strategically. 
because it's about how are we going to achieve those goals the best way possible? What are the resources that we have? Uh, there, what are the constraints, of course? And once we have the strategy, perhaps that will involve one quantitative method and one qualitative method. And for, for doing qualitative research, as, as I mentioned, you will need to be very um, empathetic with, with, with the users. You will need to have that openness and being able to establish relationship and understanding their feelings and their motivations. But on the other side, if you go into quantitative research, then you need to be very logical. You need to be able to find patterns across the data. So that's, that's very important because uh, that's how you are going to be able to understand how qualitative has an impact. Um, so I would say that, uh, and also once you already have the insights, you need to be able to communicate them. So several skills are needed, that, that would be the answer. Maybe I'm gonna end up changing my career. <laughs> Yeah, you should. Okay, so um, talking about the backgrounds, uh, social sciences is one of the most uh, popular ones. Uh, social science, sciences is think about uh, psychology or sociology. sociology. Um, it's, it's um, first of all, for qualitative research, then marketing and communications. Um, some people think that marketing is, is like the, the evil, um, <laughs> causing of, of user research because marketing thinks as segments while user research will think of personas um, but if you understand uh, that um, how, how, how to identify the user profiles and you come from marketing you might be able to understand that and of course if you are into quantitative research well there is a huge overlap with marketing because you will talk about statistically significant data and so on and business and finances mainly because of the analytical part of the user research here are some quotes the first is from Ro. it says it's the closest to an analytical and scientific approach that i love and Noemi says, it requires strong skills in observation and listening, along with a strong knowledge in a variety of user research techniques and methodologies. Awesome. Information architect. Okay, so um, let's try to think of, of an architect um, using the, the analogy of a house. So an information architect is the one who will decide how to organize content, um, just the way an architect in a house will decide um, how to organize the rooms in a house that will be after that filled with um, furniture. And that furniture might be the content in a digital space. So an information architect will plan and define structures to organize the information. And they will also uh, learn about how, you, how the users are going to use that. Just the way an architect won't build a house with five rooms for a couple, that way we won't have an information architect who will have um, a mega menu for only three items. Um, so it is, it's very important to keep this user focused. The main activities of an information architect are evaluating the findability of content within a digital product. The findability is how easy is it to find that content for a user that has a particular use case using techniques to understand the user mental model. So how, how are we connecting things or how, how, we, um, how we think of, of um, semantic groups. And for example, we will understand if users will, would group um, fruits by color rather than by shape. And we will also be working on the definition of, of the organization, navigation, and label, labeling systems, and defining the content structure and hierarchy on a digital product. How that information um, architecture will be visible for users as well. The personalities that we have, of course, no surprise, there is architect, and there is also logician, and there is executive. So um, executive people are really good, uh, for example, in organizing themselves. And that is one of the things that, that is needed here. So um, in Glyphs and Strengths, we have a range of consistency and discipline, which are more, more of the execution um, pillar. Let's think, for example, of an, an arranger of, as, as a person who will be um, knowing where to put things um, 
either either in the real world or or, or in other worlds as well. And there's consistency, which means that when you have a system, an organization, organization system, you may think of how to do things consistent so users will be able to use the knowledge they acquire in one part of your website to other part of your website. And finally, discipline, because it's, all, it's also about uh, having these ground rules and be, being able to, to attach to them and, and, and use them. Connectedness is this ability to um, identify or connect things that might feel unrelated at first, which is also needed here. And finally, we have analytical and input. Input is, is, is a funny name, but it's related to um, people who really enjoy collecting things, all kinds of things, even relationships. The backgrounds that we, we would uh, say that would have an advantage if they were to choose this, this specialty are information technologies because of the structured mindset, uh, business and finances, engineering and architecture as well. And this is a quote from Pilar. She said, I love working with data, ordering and making sense out of things and their underlying structures. Amazing. And I think what better compliment to um, an information architect than a content strategist, because if we are uh, thinking about structure, then we're going to think about what's inside that structure. So content strategies will plan, write and manage content for digital interfaces. They make sure that it's aligned with the business goals. They make sure that it's clear and compelling for users. And they make sure um, that it's properly distributed along different channels. This means that uh, it's in the right eyes again at the right time. Um, one of the things they do every day would be defining content to be generated. Uh, that's based on user needs. Um, found few tools that's content gap analysis, for example. They really define the distribution channels as well. So it's not only uh, the message, but the container. Um, for website, apps, social media, based on business and user profiles needs, I think. They're a specialty that's deeply related to visual design as well. Uh, it's like it's content counterpart, I would like to see it like that. And they also manage the generation and publishing process of content for a digital product. Um, they use artifacts such as uh, content inventories, for example, um, to make sure that they have everything mapped out and organized and make sure what is going to be where and at what time and of course why and everything uh, in service of the user of course but also uh, in service of the business and of course better digital products uh, accessible products uh, inclusive products uh, so that's something that a content strategist could do i would add something here and is that it is still being defined in the industry but sometimes content strategist uh, has a synonym synonym that is content specialist and lately it has been also called ux writer so you might find this specialty with those three names there is huge overlaps and they are still not deciding which one is the good one but um yeah this is these are the main activities of those three and i think this one has some more comprehensive name as well it, it really tells me yeah, what they do, do. Um, when we're thinking about personalities, we see uh, a lot of leaning into um, intuitive personalities. Um, we have also uh, observant personalities, for example, on the part of the diplomats, which are advocates and campaigners. Uh, again, they're very empathic, uh, they're passionate. Executives are more practical and they focus on order and secure. So this is a hybrid because um, you might have people that really love uh, writing content for the for the sake of it, and there's, there's people who love uh, making sure that everything is usable and consistent. So you have this um, both very structured and creative uh, discipline. When we talk about the split and strange, um, as I was talking to you, it's interesting because it relates a lot with visual design. You have consistency because you uh, need to have um, everything following the same uh, editorial line or the same content line or making sure that the language that you're using is consistent so the user really adopts it in a very natural way. Um, they have to be very good communicators. They have to make sure that nobody's uh, left behind uh, with the includer. And we also have this new one that we haven't touched, which is input, part of the strategic thinking. Um, someone who has the strength is someone who really, really, really loves collecting data from all sorts. So they will use these data as their pool uh, to really understand how to um, push those products further regarding this content strategy. And of course, uh, as the name implies, uh, strategic 
uh, is going to be needed because they're going to be thinking a lot about not only the, the present but the future of the product and how it's going to develop over the years. So that's that's pretty interesting as well. Uh, backgrounds. Um, this is pretty flexible as well. Uh, you can have people from social sciences, sciences, um, people related to arts and science. In this case, we see a lot of um, writers. We also see um, technical writers who kind of take this um, this approach of a hybrid within content strategy. A lot of marketing and communication could feel really natural to develop your job if you are in these industries. And another quote by, by Pilar, which we thank very much, is that even though users today mainly interact with graphic inter interfaces, information manifested as data and language, still shape the user experience of software from the inside out. So content strategies make sure that users have the certainty of navigating towards their desired goals through the appropriate modeling of content and words, word choices. So you can really see how this is super complementary to an information architect. They are deeply ingrained between each other and each one has a very specific function but in the end they're pushing for the same which is uh, have, making sure that the user goes toward the goals and it's easy and it's understandable um, either from a structure point of view or from the presentation which in this case would be the content. Now we're going to talk about UX strategist slash product designer. Um, a product designer works at the middle of user-centered design and business strategy. They will take care of the holistic design process to ensure that the final product helps both the business and the users achieve their goals in an effective way. Uh, so let's think of them as the ones that are going to be uh, aware of the whole process of design and they will be able to um, use uh, the, the goals of the business and use the, the input they have from user research and of course what they know about feasibility, technological feasibility, to put together one solution. The main activities they would do are define the product vision and strategy, align to, the, to that vision of the stakeholders in the business, defining with stakeholders the value proposition of the product that, are, that is going to be offered to users, um, identifying and keep track of success metrics, let's just think of um, key performance indicators that will help us um, measure success across time, and leading teams towards the discovery and ideation of possible solutions, to then craft plans that will allow the team to learn, build, and measure iteratively. So um, if we think of these uh, Lean UX methodologies, we would say that a product designer is the one who is going to be using them the most. Personalities that are um, considered to be the ones that might have, have a, an advantage are architect um, because they are known, uh, as I mentioned, they are known as, as having uh, everything in their heads. They are the masterminds. And there are commanders because they will be leading a team most of times. Uh, logisticians. Logisticians are very practical people who are going to be uh, finding the most effective way to get to their, to their goals. Uh, adventurer and entrepreneur. Adventurers and entrepreneurs feel really good with exploration and experimentation. And that is really needed here. So they are flexible people who will be able to learn uh, fast and iterate based on that learning. Clips and strengths. So here we have arranger and deliberative. Um, then we have um, the, the, the two pillars that are most uh, present here are uh, the one that is strategic and the one that is influence. Uh, so influence because we are talking about um, a product designer is the one who will be behind um, at the execution of several people and they will need to, to transmit the vision of the business to their teams in order to accomplish their goals. Uh, then we have an execution adaptability and positivity. Why is that? We might think that positivity is one of these strengths that no one cares about because, you know, it's just like, okay, see, seeing the glass uh, half full and that's it. Uh, however, positivity, people who have this, they are very good at recovering from failure. They are really good at uh, finding how to, how to make things work. And that is why we think that that is um, that's important here. They are 
there's also about adaptability, which might complement that in a, in a very good way. And then we have futuristic, um, because, because of this vision they need to have for what is happening right now, how are we going to use that in order to get where we want to be in the future? And there is intellectual learner and of course, strategy. The backgrounds are project management, arts and design, and in engineering and architecture. Did you remember uh, why did we think that arts and design would be uh, a good fit here? I think it was because um, since they're very uh, familiar with, with uh, design processes, um, they could really take the point of view on, on designers so that would create better leadership when thinking about strategy. So they might be able to um, create more feasible solutions and not think too outside of the box and create strategies that really uh, involve the team. So they think so if I was a designer, maybe um, this is a roadmap or a timeline that I might be able to, to, to deliver within uh, and, and not put their teams into these really um, super stretched deadlines, for example, we thought that um, that could be a great point. Mm, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, this is a quote that I really like from Adam. It says, a good strategy is what drives design to success. So that's why, why we uh, would choose this, this specialty. And Christy says, I think it's a wonderful chance of doing something meaningful, taking into consideration what people actually need and resolving real problems. We will be able to meet her later in this, in this webinar. Amazing. Okay, so let's go now with service designer. We're almost at the end of this part, so don't get desperate. A service designer will focus on customer service experiences and create sustainable solutions for both customers and service providers involved. So they will take care of the whole environment of a product. And they will be defining and enhancing processes across multiple channels, contexts, and products. So we might think of a UX designer as the one who is in charge of one particular interaction, a service designer might take care of the whole um, spectrum of interactions and the touch points that a customer has with a company. So the main activities are facilitating workshops with stakeholders in order to define the design strategy of their service. And they will be going through customer data uh, in order to understand their needs and pain points. They will be mapping the experience of users' clients. This, one, this is one of, of is one of the biggest across the different touch points with the service. And after mapping those experiences, they will be uh, figuring out how to solve those critical pain points and mapping the processes, of course, of the company that have an impact on that experience. So what is in the background? Um, the user is feeling this, but what are the processes and what are the activities and the actors that are uh, doing things um, underground? So users can have that on top. Personalities we considered are architect, debater, and entrepreneur. Um, these are, uh, most of them are strategic, are, are most, uh, have this um, open mind and, and they, they like to see the, the, the big picture uh, of things. Uh, uh, talking about the Clifton strengths, we talked, we, we thought of restorative because that is a strength that gives you this um, motivation when you see that something's broken. <laughs> so that motivates you much more than if, than if, if everything's good. And when you're doing service design, most of the times something is going to be broken. Um, then we have adaptability and positivity, which will help you uh, overcome that. And we have communication, competition and significance. Competition because also, also, we are, we are talking about this um, um, benchmarking. Um, do we want to compare your, your experience, your, your service to, to the one of the competition? And when talking about significance, we're talking about having an impact, a positive impact, and doing things for a purpose. And most of the time, you will find that purpose in the people that uh, are built either um, facing the, this. Um, this, this service that you are offering as customers, but also the employees, for example. And communication, you need to be really good at that because all, again, you will be in the middle of the customers and the business. And finally, we have the, the um, 
strategic um, strengths, which are futuristic, intellectual, learner, and strategic. Amazing. And uh, yeah. Yeah, so some of the backgrounds here um, that we consider that could, would be a good fit are project management, arts and design, and engineering and architecture. And here we have a couple of quotes. The first is from Elves. She says, there is a need to understand the bigger picture in order to support the product design development. It requires thinking in systems, understanding people beyond any service, and being able to navigate uncertainty of change without the fear of proposing something new to improve. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I think we, we could have uh, summarized everything into that single quote. And Manuel says, it combines several realms of design and is not limited to the screen and appreciate the fact that it creates an experience for all players in the solution. Pretty novel as well. Uh, finally, to close this segment, um, there's, there's this key role which is supporting, uh, you can see that it supports all of the previous one, which is uh, more uh, towards the people management area, which in this case are UX managers, um, or design managers, if you want to call them like that. Uh, they're they're a, a, bit of a vital link between the company and design team. They really know how to give uh, direction and use uh, problems from the skills to get their team to realize the best method to do their work the best and to be successful. Um, they're really, really, really focused on developing the careers of their designers. So that's a very noble purpose and it's very important because they are the backbone of the organizations. Uh, nothing feels better than having a good design manager, some, someone that supports you and um, cares for your growth and can really give you that direction, even to choose one of these specialties, for example. So, if I were to be a manager, I would care about my individual designers and I will actively work every day to help them grow their careers. Um, they will be teaching designers important skills and giving them valuable feedback. This is crucial. The, the, the fact that they're capable to give um, actionable and, and, and object, objective feedback to them to make them grow, they help them navigate difficult situations and they give them clarity on what's important to focus on at the moment, if they're overwhelmed, for example. Uh, they really collaborate closely with other units in the company. This is why I told you that it was a vital link because uh, they, they make sure to take care of everything that's on the background so the designers can design and, and, and just focus on what really matters to them. So in this case, they facilitate a lot of collaboration between designers and other departments or business units. Um, personalities, now we have a, a lot of flexibility as well as we have in researchers because there's a lot of ways that you can do management. Um, but we, uh, for example, a commander is someone who could do it in a more uh, prescriptive way while um, advocators, um, mediators and protagonists, which are diplomats, they uh, tend to be more passionate and more empathic towards their, their, um, their people. So that's a different kind of leadership, but uh, none is best that, than, than the other. Uh, finally, we have uh, defender and counsel, which are, um, even when they're observant and judging personalities, um, they are really warm and they really care about their people. So uh, that's where the name defender comes, because they're really uh, aware of what's happening and they really want to defend um, people that are important to them, in this case, their teammates. Um, when we talk about the strengths that, that we find and believe that would be good for, for this specialty, we see a ranger again, make sense of things, uh, make sure that everything is in order so they, the designers can make their jobs. Um, believe, this is a tricky one that we found um, a really interesting place here in a home uh, because someone who is uh, on the belief strength they have a solid um, set of values and people usually see them as, wow, you really have uh, your life in order and, and you have all of these um, like values or, or um, you know what moves you, you know what's right, you believe in these things and that's what makes them uh, very relatable leaders and people want to emulate that. So that makes them, um, this strength makes them great leaders in this case. Restorative again, taking something and seeing the potential and, and, and taking that to his, to his glory. Uh, we see command for, for more direct management styles, maximizer, which is making sure that you use all of the resources to make the best out of a situation or a designer. Uh, developers, they, they find a lot of joy and an achievement in making sure everybody uh, grows. Um, harmony, it's, it's, uh, it's a trait that makes you um, procure 
that everything runs smoothly in an emotional level. So this is a great uh, trait to have as well. Individualization refers that you know that each person is a unique individual and you treat them as so. They don't uh, put people into boxes. So that makes them really personal and, 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 and good leaders in that sense. Futuristic because they, they tend to see uh, uh, not only the present, but, but the future and what's gonna happen to the career of the designers. And finally strategic because they wanna make sure that they can provide all of this within the context of, of business and personal growth as well. Uh, backgrounds, this can be any background at all, but uh, arts and design could be a great starting point because you will have the perspective of the people you're managing. Social sciences could give you very um, uh, psychology insights, for example, or, or a deeper bond as an individual with your uh, reports. And finally, project managers uh, could have a great edge because they know how to make sure that um, they can scope projects properly, they can understand how to run them, they can troubleshoot uh, if something goes wrong in the, in the middle of the development of a project. And a quote again from Rodrigo is that he loved being a manager because you interact deeply with very different personalities and each one enriches you in his own unique way. So as you can see, it's a very noble purpose. It's, it's fantastic to have this backbone to support all of the, all of the, the other specialties. And that will be the end of this segment, which um, of course is difficult to synthesize a specialty into three slides and, and given our approach, we really encourage you to go. And if something sparked your interest, really take a, a deep dive into that. And um, they not only do those things, they do many, many things and they might take and borrow from other specialties as well. So this is, this is a world and, and these specialties live in ecosystems, so they might develop themselves differently in one industry or on another or in one company to another and they might express themselves different in an individual and another so what we wanted to do was synthesize as much as we could this information so you could take better decisions and so you could understand what they're about and how you could get an edge but in the end uh, follow your passion and and, and 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 follow your heart through these ones and, and that's what's going to help you uh, choose the very specialty for you and uh, we prepared something special to close this, uh, this webinar. Um, we took from our pool of, of the research and we have some amazing people today that we think are very good at their job and they're leaning into some of these specialties and they're gonna share with us uh, today a little bit of their insights uh, doing these, these tests and, and, and feeling how they, they, they are part of their work life and their life uh, overall. Did I get that right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> awesome. So we're gonna invite these people to open up their cameras. Um, might stop sharing so we can take a look at their um, their faces while they're doing this storytelling. Uh, no, we, we have the slides Before, ready. Yeah. Right, we have the slides ready with some data and information of them so they can talk over them. Sorry, I, I got that as a mistake. And the first person I that think, yeah, oh, oh, sorry, yeah, no, no. I, I think it would be great if we uh, introduce them at the beginning yeah. all of them and then your idea is is, is great to um, stop sharing so we can see their faces amazing so we have um christina vasquez today with us we're gonna have rodrigo partida we're gonna have pilar gomez uh jesus gutierrez and finally maximiliano gutierrez and the idea as you can see is that you can see the results of their tests and we're gonna they're going to walk you through how these relate to what they're doing. We have a couple questions uh, prepared for them uh, in front of they don't know this. We wanted to keep this as casual as we can. Uh, what we can tell you is that we found a lot of consistency and all of the research we did was not to push this idea, but to really figure out if we could add some value. And since we found consistency and we found that um, it was really bad by the research we did. Um, we thought it was very important for us to share it and we put our hearts into this and it's, it's lovely that we can share it with, with these people today. So I think without further ado, we can start with Chris. Yeah, for sure. Chris T, are you on the call? Do you want to stop sharing now? No, I think we can leave so everybody can see and, and oh, okay. they will pop up there. Uh, Chris T, you on the call? can unmute myself here. Okay, give me one minute and let me see if I can unmute you. Uh, if not, Bunny, could you help me with this, please? Well, 
Hi guys, I'm here. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Christy, please introduce yourself to the audience today and then we'll throw a couple questions. First, hi everybody, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Christina, I'm a senior UX designer here at Blastline. Um, I've been working as a UXer for at least five years now. And before all that, I was working on editorial and branding. I used that, I studied at Ipeso, uh, design, which gives me a very holistic approach into every project. And I think that's it. Thank you. You want to? Uh, sure. Um, first of all, we would like to know, uh, Christy, how would you say that your personality advocate um, and your strengths are helping you in your day-to-day -day activities? I think she got muted again. So, <laughs> Bunny, could you help me unmute her? There you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, can you repeat the question again, Claire? Yeah, sure. Um, I was thinking of um, how is your personality and your, and your Clifton strengths um, helping you in your day-to-day -day activities as a UX designer, a senior UX designer? Of course, I think it plays a very important part. Uh, as I was reading this Clifton strengths, one of the top things that uh, I was shocked to discover was this achiever uh, prompt. This is something that I struggle at the beginning to relate to, but the mode that I analyzed it is maybe how I am constantly trying to be very effective with the calls that I take, how I'm um, taking uh, quick decisions and very practical in the way that I approach every project. So that's something that I struggle at the beginning, but now I can understand. Definitely connectedness has been very, very useful. As I mentioned at the beginning, I have this holistic approach because I studied uh, design at, at ITESO. And uh, the thing is, I've managed to find very different passions across my life. I am currently studying my master's degree in sexuality and gender equality. And I think that even though that it's a very different area, it gives me a new perspective and a new life in the way that I analyze every product that I'm now creating. Uh, maybe in terms of inclusion and accessibility and finding those links and those connections has made me be better at uh, how I approach life and my work. That's great. Thank you so much, Christy. Should we go now with... Um... Yeah, I think we might keep it short because we have, uh, we're a little bit short on time, but Christy, thank you very much for this answer. We're going to move now um, with Rodrigo Partida. Uh, Ro, are you on the call? And if you are, could you please, uh, Vanny, help us in meeting him? Yes. There you go. Hi, everyone. And thank Hello, you for going? the invitation. No problem. Um, could you please introduce yourself uh, with the audience today? Of course. Hello. So my name is Rodrigo Partida. I'm a senior UX manager. Uh, I've been in Wiseline for about five years now. Uh, and I love focusing on anything related to team growth. Uh, I've been tracking the psychological safety of, of the design team since a couple of years ago now. And uh, I've been in charge of a lot of team building exercises and things like that. That's really good. Thank you, Ra. Um, so for you, we have this question. Um, which of your Clifton strengths uh, would you say you, you like the most or are the ones that are helping you grow the most as a UX manager? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, definitely del deliberative and relator connected with me. Um, actually analytical uh, also to make it a top three. Um, so deliberative because it's about making very careful decisions. And as a manager, you need to consider very different factors from different dimensions like uh, 
the, the impact on people wellness, the impact on the project, the impact on the timelines. Uh, so um, I, I like to make a lot of questions to myself and to others before making a decision and implementing it. Uh, in regards to, to analytical, uh, I'm a, a, a big uh, question making fan. Uh, uh, I like to uh, make sure I, I get the problem from different angles before having a posture about it or, or defining an, an opinion. Uh, so it's become a habit. And finally, relator. Um, uh, actually, you told me, Emilio, that, that you have noticed that I have inside jokes with everyone. And well, uh, getting to meet everyone personally makes me uh, understand a lot about their capabilities and their talents. So uh, it's in the name. I mean, it says relator because it's about connection. And I've made, I've made so many good connections, uh, not only of myself with others, but also between others. I've introduced people that some might have something that others need and things like that. That's great. Uh, so just for the audience to know, uh, at first, Ro was not buying the harmony strength, but mm -hmm. Emilio and I convinced him that, that is, after telling them that that is exactly the way we felt each time we interacted with him at work. Thank you, Clara. Yeah, that, that's right. Uh, in the beginning, it didn't click so much with me. Uh, it still wasn't in my top three, but uh, I, I'm pretty happy with the Clifton strengths that I got. Amazing. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much for, for giving up your time and for participating in this research as well. Thank you, folks. Awesome. We're going to move now uh, with Pilar, who's very active in the chat. Thank you very much and gave us great quotes today. So Pilar, you're gonna be unmuted in a sec uh, by Vanny, and we'd love you to introduce yourself and then we're gonna throw in a question for you. Good, uh, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Pilar, I am from Guadalajara and I studied communications for my bachelor's degree actually. Uh, so I've been an information specialist since 2013. Um, a couple of years ago, I went to New York to study interaction. I did this uh, program at New York University that's called Interactive Telecommunications Program. And there, their prerogative was to look at the adjacent possible. So it was all about finding connections where people assume there are none. Um, later that I did these two um, tests, I realized that connection and building bridges is at the core of what I do and what I've done since the beginning, but now I not only have my expertise as an information specialist, but I also have the interaction part of it, which is what moves the universe, uh, what keeps the universe going. So I don't know if you have questions for me. I <laughs> Yes, I will. We have one, but you already started answering it. Uh, so uh, the question is, how do you think that knowing this about yourself, which is your personality and your clips and strengths, can help you decide um, which UX specialty to choose in the future? Oh, gee, like, uh, I don't know, at the team, but currently in the team, I'm, I'm seen as like a, a content specialist, but I, I would also say that my other great love is interaction design. So I really see these two things as, uh, two parts of the same coin and be, uh, no, ex no user experience is complete without addressing both. But um, I guess a funny thing about my personality is uh, I'm, I'm an introvert. I know I don't sound like one because I ramble a lot, but I am. <laughs> uh, but in the rest of the things, especially in the, media, in, in the 16 traits uh, test, I tend to be equal parts analytical and emp emp empathetic or like thinking, feeling, I'm a little bit more feeling, uh, perspective, judging, 46 to 54%. So um, I really guess I can be the link that I am and connect with the development teams the way I do or with project managers or other designers because I have these two 
tensions competing with each other and 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 that solves them itself as as as, as productive uh design work i hope uh yes that just reminded me that you you are the person who found this link between what a technical writer does and what a content strategist uh, might do right no like actually like uh, me and the design director Joel, we nerd about this a lot and we found out that atlation has this discipline called information experience so oh. uh yeah it was definitely not me but i'm advocating for it uh, within the organization as well because i think that technical writers have also like an, am an amazing potential to partner with us to make more um humane and and, and delightful products i hate delightful it's, it's <laughs> strong I'm sorry no, no, no. it's perfect that's just there amazing peter thank you so much thank you for having me um now we're gonna go with uh chuchu gutierrez um you're gonna be on here in a second uh now we're shifting towards visual design in the disciplines and we'd love to get to know um who are you? And then we will throw a couple of questions. So as soon as you're ready, you can start. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jesus Gutierrez, but everyone calls me Chucho. I'm a senior visual designer here on Wiseline. I've been on Wiseline for a year. I enter a, like a senior UI designer, but we are having like this whole naming convention changing. And um, before that, I was like uh, the only designer on a company with like uh, 1500 people something like that so I have to do everything from UX UI product design information design uh, uh, architecture wherever you want to name it so uh, I started as a graphic designer and I've been doing quite a lot and hold the field for almost 15 years now it's so, so much time but yeah that's it <laughs> Amazing, Chucho. I have a I have a question for you. As we can see on the screen, you have this personality and strengths. All are um, really strategical and logical, and at the same time, you're developing a work that could sometimes be considered really creative. Um, how do you think that this? Very, it's very defined your profile, as you can see. How do you think this this has shaped the way you approach uh, visual design or user interface? That is a, the your specialty. I, I I think it comes as an instinct when you're young. I don't know. I, I didn't notice when I was 18 years old and I was trying to find a career. Uh, but uh, I, I like both sides. I like things that look pretty. I like things that work. But I like things that are logical and make sense and helps people. So this is, I, I think, that's why I chose the career that I choose. Uh, so I, I try to uh, have a, a balance between all of that, like I, I like to open an app and say, oh my god, this looks beautiful. I don't know what it does, but, but it, it looks beautiful. Look the colors, look the animations, it makes so much sense. And then you start using it and you start wondering like how, how they uh, how they are able to do something that it's so so pretty, so nice but that also helps you and also makes your life better. And, you know, everything should be like that. And this is what, the, 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 what I like to do. Like, I, I like to analyze problems. I like to ideate what, how we could take this problem, a problem that it's usually an ugly thing, something that it's missing, like a void in the space. And, and pulling out your intellect to it, to, to create something that works, that solves this problem, but also solves the problem to have more beauty in the world, that it's something that we should all strive for. That's amazing, Chucho, and really awesome. Thank you very much for participating in this. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Chucho. And finally, we're gonna have Max, um, amazing designer and very great friend of us. Uh, so when you're muted, uh, please introduce yourself, and then we'll throw a little question your way there you go hey how are you doing uh thank you so much for for this chance to to speak about about design and well uh my name is max i started as a really artistic creative little guy 
And um, when the time came to, to choose a profession, I did a bachelor in animation and digital art. And from that moment, I started experiencing and uh, meeting new people, new professions. And today I might say that I'm a, a, a designer that believes in digital transformation, the power of technology, the power of design. And I would say that uh, my yin and yang are user needs and business objectives because I know that they correlate and when they work together, you can like achieve amazing things. Awesome, thank you, Max. Uh, so would you like to launch a question? Sure, um, so in this case, you have a very particular profile because I see that your background is very, very creative, even to the point of going into animation and digital arts which is something that we will commonly see more towards perhaps visual design, for example. I think that's more common to see. On the other side, your strengths are really more into this um, strategic part of design, which is, I think, more related to UX design as you, as you um, practice it. And on the other hand, your personality goes back again to the artistic <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so, you yourself have a yin yang going on, and I really want to know um, what if you went into UX design rather than visual design, and how these strengths come to help you when you're doing that? Okay, uh, and when I think of that, uh, I love like when you were talking about all the specialties of design, I was like, Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like that. Oh my god, <laughs> I like that. But the <laughs> differentiator is when, when I'm actually working on it, and when suddenly, like, my my body stays in the computer, but my mind is super active and energetic and feeling great. Is when I strategize, when I when I think, when I when I learn. And for example, my creative background really helps me because uh, I I really enjoy product design. So in order to 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 be a a good product designer, you have to understand all the all the perks, all the challenges of visual design of technical aspects of all this all these little elements that will make the product succeed so so yeah i think that i have like different aspects of my personality but the ones that really uh, make me feel like super powerful is when i learn when i when i when i strategize when i listen to people and then i come try to come with that solution to that problem so so yeah that's me <laughs> that's that's an amazing answer thank you very much max sure thank you thank you it's so great uh, the, the fun thing about this is that um we, we we didn't know these answers so i feel like i'm taking also something from this webinar <laughs> and it is a very powerful yeah, note um that's gonna be the end of our roadmap for today which uh, leads us to the questions and answers. I want to be very respectful of everybody's time. And I know that we're clocking already at what is supposed to be the end of this webinar. So I'm going to just read the questions that we have in the chat right now. But we're going to give you a survey link. Please reach out there and we'll, make, we'll try to make sure to address those questions. Uh, personally, you can reach out via LinkedIn as well and we'll try to start a conversation. Uh, there might be a lot of these, um, a lot of questions regarding this, so make sure that you leave. Uh, it, it, we're going to give you a, a form in the end uh, so you can leave uh, all feedback or what questions you have, and we'll make sure and we'll try our best to address them if they're allowed. Um, so, for starters, we have this one which says um, Do you have personality traits or white lines for other roles, such as uh, cloud engineer, back end engineer? Front end or software developer. We don't. Actually, we're piloting this exercise, but if you love this, please let us know and then maybe we can help uh, people that have all the know how in those specialties uh, bring this uh, same methodology to life so they can help you choose uh, a more technical specialty with this same approach that so far we think it works wonders. Uh, there's, there's an interesting one from Sunder. It says, what is the future growth of UX specialists or just UX as a whole? You want to take a step at that one? Sure. So let's think of UX specialists are, as things that are growing in their, in their own 
uh, basis. So, for example, uh, we were we mentioned before that a content strategy might be seen as, as uh, UX writing nowadays because the tasks that are being developed there are evolving, and there is evolution in in each of these specialties. And there is also happening that uh, in the in in the past we would have UI and visual designer as one specialty, and be, even before that we would have um, this broad uh, design as one particular specialty within technology. So uh, what is happening as a phenomenon is that it, it, is, um, it is becoming more granular with the time. In this case, um, it is being mentioned this anticipatory design and those are, um, we can see those as approaches to design. Um, those um, are seen as these uh, concepts or, or a, a way to, to approach design in a, in a different way. And um, however, uh, those are, in, in this moment, those are emerging. So let's think of each of those approaches um, we'll be using of these specialties in the future. It's not like they are um, unrelated. It's more of, of the thing that um, it's different approaches that the specialties are uh, very um, goals and tasks oriented. And on the other hand, this, um, what you're, what you're, when you are talking about um, ways to approach design in a way that it uh, involves the user, but it also takes into account um, other aspects of that interaction, then you, without noticing, will be covering some of these specialties. So at the end, it's, it's all part of the same thing. That's a great answer. Thank you. And we have one last one, which is, um, I think it's from uh, Sandra again, which is, I've, I've also heard about anticipatory design and automated design. Does that fit into one of the specialist fields that was mentioned, or are these emerging fields in design? I, to be honest, I don't have the knowledge to answer this question, so I wouldn't feel comfortable. Do you? Um, no more than what I already mentioned, which is there are different approaches, and each day we are we are getting into new ones. You know, and in technology, changes change. I mean, changes come over time, and that's that's um, that's for sure. So at the end, um, I don't want to explore more into this because I also don't have the basis. But I would say that um, when you are taking an approach. Um, it's not like you are uh, stopping seeing the others. Um, most likely you will be, uh, want to be aware of what are the others approach, how, how might they overlap because most of the time they do. Yeah, and I think specialties, uh, they might be a lot of them regarding specific uh, industries or specific um, projects. We try to make this as, uh, as well-rounded as possible based on the ones that we see the most of work and we interact the most with. I'm sure there's a lot of there. So um, please do look into that and you can take the ones that we shown you today as a starting point, for example. And not only as how to choose them, but what makes someone good to being one of those. So maybe if you can find parallels between the ones that we show you and the ones that you're interested, for example, the automated design, you can really understand what could make you good or have you uh, have an advantage for that. Um, we're going to address just one more, which is how can we utilize test results to create or contribute to our personal brand and making sure the brand sticks. Um, I have a very strong opinion relating um, personal brand, which I believe it, it really doesn't exist um, as, as typically is explained. I think, of course, you can create your, your public persona and social media and share these things, and that could be considered a personal brand. But in the end, it all circles back to um, how people interact with you. That's the real essence of the brand. So if you want to figure out how to utilize this test um, for you to be a, be a better professional and create these better connections, which is really what I perceive as a personal brand, uh, it all, first it is capitalize on your strengths figure out how you're good and make sure that you're managing the flow counterpart of, of, of them. And on the other hand, um, make sure that you understand all of, the, all of the personalities and all of the strengths. So when you come across new professionals or very different professionals uh, as you, you can quickly have an edge and know how to interact and know how to get the best out of, of 
those people. And even getting to very interesting conversations on this is how I like to collaborate or this is how my brain is wired and this is how I can better contribute to your project. So I think that's the best way you can do it. And uh, yeah. That's great. We're, I know that we said that we were only um, answering one more question, but we already, it happens that we have a slide to address the one of Alejandro and I will, I will just. Amazing. Ah, there we go. <laughs> So these are all uh, three programs. The first one is the one we're going to be launch on, launching next year. Um, then there is uh, the certificate program by Nielsen Norman Group. Here's the link as well. You will be able to choose uh, a specialty over, over their programs. And finally, information design specialization program, which is, uh, this is one of the first uh, courses I took early in my career. And I, I found it really, really helpful. Um, so the first one is only a waiting list. So if, if you are interested in taking this, you might just uh, sign on and we will be contacting you soon. Amazing. So I'm going to move again to the um, feedback story slide. Uh, as many people are requesting these uh, slides to take a, look, a deeper look at them, we'll make sure to uh, get them through you. Don't worry about that. It might take a couple of days because we're going to make sure that it's a readable PDF. This is more on our presentation side, even if it was heavier information, there's still, there's still things that we can polish. And uh, we, we really, really, really want to thank you for giving us your time. One and a half hour is a huge honor for us to have uh, on behalf of Wiseline and Wiseline Academy. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us. We really hope that the content of this presentation was useful to you because we really put our hearts into it. And um, it was an amazing experience, an amazing discovery thing for us. And what better cause than helping somebody um, uh, understand and find a way through, through UX, which is something that, that we love. Uh, thank you for all of your comments and we really appreciate your feedback so we can get much more useful content uh, into your, your eyes and your ears and your hands. So um, thank you very much. Have a lovely day, afternoon, and uh, we'll see you soon in another webinar.